Now, as many of you know, nuclear weapons were first developed during the Second World War. In fact, back in the 1930s, Nazi scientists were making significant progress in the development of nuclear energy. Uh, this greatly worried uh, the aforementioned Albert Einstein, who was forced to leave Germany, and led him to uh, send a letter to President Roosevelt, urging him to intensify the research of the United States into nuclear weapons. This ultimately gave rise to the Manhattan Project, or more formally known as the Manhattan Engineering District, where the first nuclear weapons were developed. It was here that scientists like Enrico Fermi uh, realized that the explosive energy released from splitting a big nucleus apart um, can be effectively used using a chain reaction. You see, for big nuclei, such as those of uranium or plutonium, we can initiate a fission reaction, i.e. split them apart, by shooting a neutron into them. <coughs> Furthermore, when these nuclei undergo the fission reaction, they will split into smaller nuclei, as well as a number of neutrons. So, when we have a number of these nuclei closely together, and we shoot a neutron into one, it will break apart, send out neutrons, and well, these neutrons subsequently hit other nuclei, which then again undergo a fission reaction and send out even more neutrons, hitting again even more nuclei, so on and so forth. Now, of course, each of these fission reactions also releases energy. So, as a chain reaction progresses, more and more energy will be released, essentially creating potentially a rather large explosion. Now, this is all well and good, but as it turns out, to sustain a chain reaction like this, the fission material needs to be sufficiently dense. In other words, the nuclei have to be close enough together so that each neutron will actually hit another nuclei. A material which has this density is said to have critical mass. As it turns out, so neither uranium nor plutonium do naturally have critical mass. That is no problem, however. It just meant that the bomb makers had to be a little more creative. Well, two mechanisms were developed to turn the material from being a subcritical mass to being a supercritical mass. These were gun type assembly and implosion. Now, the gun type assembly mechanism is quite simple. Uh, you take a, a long closed up cylinder, you take two pieces of uranium, put them at each end, and also add a bit of a chemical explosive behind one of them. When you want to detonate the bomb, uh, you launch the chemical explosive, shooting both pieces of uranium together, and as they merge under the great pressure, they will form a supercritical mass. Then you just need to launch a small flux of neutrons into them, and bang, you have your chain reaction. Um, the first nuclear bomb ever built was based on a mechanism like this, and not so appropriately, it was called Little Boy. It was three meters long, uh, had a mass of about 400 kilograms, only 60 of which were actually made from uh, the uranium, and it was launched on Hiroshima in August of 1945. Considering the extent of the destruction caused by this bomb, which is still visible today, um, it is quite amazing to consider that only 0.7 kilograms of this bomb are predicted to have actually undergone fission. As I said, even a small change of mass can release a lot of energy. Now, the gun type assembly is not suitable for plutonium, as plutonium itself uh, releases a great amount of neutrons 
and thus must be kept at a lower density to start with. Therefore, uh, the implosion mechanism was developed. In this mechanism, uh, the plutonium is surrounded on all sides uh, by shells of chemical explosives, almost like a football. When they are launched, they push the plutonium inwards, increasing its density greatly. And as the plutonium keeps releasing neutrons itself, uh, allow it to initiate the explosion naturally. A bomb using this mechanism was released on the town of Nagasaki uh, in the same year, only three days after uh, the detonation of Little Boy. And it was quite appropriately named Fat Man. It was 4.3 meters long, had a total mass of 630 kilograms and exploded with a yield equivalent to 20 kilotons of TNT, making it almost twice as powerful as Little Boy. Now, after these and other bombings, Japan eventually surrendered and the war ended. However, it was not the end of nuclear weapons. Not long after these developments, the American realized that the Russians had caught up with them and built their own fission bombs. Uh, hence, it, they had to push on to build even bigger and better bombs. Well, as there is a limit to how big uh, a fission bomb you can build, there was only one way to go. In other words, we ventured on to build the first fusion bombs. Well, while uranium and plutonium are quite limited on this planet, we have plenty of atoms containing small nuclei, like hydrogen, which we could use to uh, release energy through fusion. These fusion bombs are also known as hydrogen or thermonuclear bombs. And, well, their principle is simple. All you have to do is take an amount of hydrogen atoms, uh, heat them up and squeeze them together enough so that they overcome their electromagnetic repulsion so that they can be pushed together to be fused into bigger nuclei and hence release fusion energy. Well, the amount of energy required to accomplish this is actually quite great. And while I cannot comment much on the design of a fusion bomb, it turns out it is actually necessary to use an entire fission bomb to launch it. Now, the first successful fusion bomb was called Mike, and it was uh, launched in 1952 on an American island. It had a mass of 82 tons, so it was almost 200 times as heavy as Little Man. However, its energy output was almost a thousand times as big. It produced an explosion equivalent to about uh, 10 megatons of TNT. It produced a fireball almost three miles wide and a mushroom cloud which reached about 17 kilometers into the sky. It produced a crater uh, about 1.8 kilometers wide and about 50 meter deep. You can probably even spot it on the map. However, this was yet to be topped by its successor Bravo which was launched on the Bikini Islands in 1954 with an explosive energy equivalent to 15 megatons of TNT. While the explosive load on this bomb was actually less than that of its predecessor, uh, it used deuterium instead of hydrogen, which surprisingly ended up boosting the energy output by uh, 250%. This was unfortunate because the test site chosen was not suitable for this type of explosion. The scientists conducting the experiment were forced to stay in the bunker for an extended period and uh, 
a group of Japanese fishers was uh, contaminated. The government subsequently designated an exclusion zone of 570,000 square miles. And this event is still considered the worst radiological disaster in the history of the United States. Nevertheless, all modern fusion weapons today are based on this very example. Now, a lot of time has passed since then. Not only are there more of these weapons, but there are more countries which possess them, making many of us understandably scared that one day we will in fact use them against each other. Others would argue that um, having these weapons is actually a assuring peace nowadays. The reason being is that if one country started using them, the others would too, and it would result in mutually assured destruction. In other words, if one country used nukes on another, they would get nuked back and both would be annihilated equally, and no one would gain anything. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I greatly preferred a world in which we reached and sustained peace through mutual understanding and shared goals. Well, as opposed to fear and greed. Furthermore, in my opinion, I think we shouldn't use physics or science in general for such destructive purposes. Instead, I think we should consider it a tool to but to understand the world around us and to use it in ways to improve our lives. Uh, in any case, I hope you enjoyed this video and I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. Till then, all the best and goodbye.